Hey y'all, welcome back to the 1776 podcast. This episode we have on Jay and Chrissy Kleberg. I hope I'm saying their last name correctly. Uh, but man, did we have a good time talking. Um, they came on mainly to talk about a film they have coming out called Chasing the Tide, uh, where Jay and his wife Chrissy hiked the entire Texas coastline and filmed and documented the entire thing, did a variety of interviews, um, and really highlighted just how beautiful it is, and also a lot of the conservation issues that we have going along the coastline that, quite frankly, I knew nothing about. And so they really shed a lot of light on the film they have coming out, a lot of the conservation topics we have going on on the coast down there. Um, and they also dove into their personal life a bit. That was just fascinating. I didn't expect um, to get into that, but I'm sure glad we did. Um, it was a lot of fun. This might be, may, might be my favorite podcast, definitely up there, of the ones we've done so far. Um, and you will see us drinking normal bot- bottled water, even though our sponsor is Rambler. And so a uh, huge shout out to Rambler. Rambler. Unfortunately, we drank all of the supply that we had from them, um, and which was quite a bit, but uh, we're big fans. And so we, we crushed it pretty quick. And so need to go pick up some more, but big shout out to Rambler. They're a local Austin company um, that really puts their money where their mouth is on, on conservation and giving back. Um, and so if you're going to buy sparkling water, I definitely check out Rambler, uh, great folks over there and they're a local Austin company. So I'd love to support them all we can, all we can. Uh, so I hope you all enjoy this episode. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. It's great to have you guys here. Yeah. I have so many questions for you, from Texas Parks and Wildlife to hiking the entire coastline um, to working with Ben Masters, who was our first guest on the podcast. Um, and so, I mean, there's a million different questions I already have for you, but I don't know that much about you or both of you, really. And so I think maybe just to kick us off, could you just tell us kind of high level your history, your background, kind of how you ended up where you are? Sure. Uh, I grew up on the King Ranch in South Texas and... Uh, my folks both both worked there, uh, ended up going to school there for a few years, um, and then ended up in Brazil, I guess, kind of early adulthood. Uh, how in the world did you, is that, how, you know, no one just ends up in Brazil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Can we side well, venture so, <laughs> Yeah, my, my uh, family's business had expanded there in the 50s. Oh, interesting. And, and my brother, who's a little bit older than me, ended up managing our last uh, international holding which happened to be in Brazil and so when I was in college I went and visited him and um, at the time I think I was a sophomore in college and I thought like at some some point I want to come back here and I don't know if it'll be in the same capacity because we were really trying to get rid of our international ranches at the time but I want to come back and ended up uh, stumbling into an opportunity with a couple a guy from uh, Texas, who had gone to a school called TCU Ranch Management, and met his wife, who was from Brazil, and they ended up uh, running a ranch in the middle of the Amazon or wow. the southeastern basin. And um, just a so cattle I, ranch. Yeah, it was a cattle ranch, exactly. And uh, also starting to bring folks from mostly from the United States down to see what was happening, which is pretty large scale deforestation area the size of Maryland was being deforested every year. I mean, that's probably the only way you can run cattle down there, right? I mean, you have to clear to get enough land for them. Yeah, and it's a much longer conversation uh, (laughs) than we have today, but there's a way to do it just just like we do in the United States to balance um, the um, ecosystem environmental concerns with food production. And um, so the couple that I was with was were, were trying to do that and promote it, and they'd started a nonprofit, and they were working with um, in, indigenous peoples from the third largest indigenous reserve in the world. And so I went down there for what was going to be six months, and I stayed for three and a half years. Was this your early 20s? Yeah, early 20s. Okay. And um, was really it, it intended to just stay there for a little bit to um, – I was an English major, and so I thought, you know, this would be, like, good inspiration uh, to write. And then really felt passionate about what was going on down there. And um, we, we tried to form a landowner-based conservation organization that involved indigenous tribes and uh, farmers and ranchers and 
uh, it's it's a very challenging environment uh, I'm sure. in which to work both private sector and also in the nonprofit sector. And so ended up becoming a pilot. And then we met through really through conservation and research. Yes. He was trying to hire somebody to come down. I want the story. Oh, let's, go, let's do it. <laughs> it sounds like a good one. Yeah. Well, I born and raised in Texas from San Antonio and degree was in wildlife management from Texas Tech. And I graduated, was back at home, looking for a research job and a mutual friend, uh, well, introduced us. Mm -hmm. And so we met up while I was in San Antonio, um, looking to hire a Jaguar researcher or something. Yeah, yeah. There, there was a, a couple that was doing research on Jaguar in the southern part of the country, in Brazil, and we thought we, we thought we had a subspecies of Jaguar. Uh, they look different, and you can't always tell uh, subspecies based on phenotype of what they look like, but we thought they were smaller, they were like a, a wider color than you might see in the Pantanal or the upper part of the Amazon basin, and so to attract these scientists to come do research, we thought we would uh, entice them with a American-trained uh, field biologist. And so Chrissy fit the bill. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, you were there getting your pilot's license. In Brazil, you got your pilot's license? Or no, in no, San Antonio. I'm not that say, crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, say, no, no. Cow. <laughs> I'm working on my pilot's license right now, and I'm like, in Brazil? That's <laughs> holy cow. Okay, yeah. sorry, sorry. No. <laughs> we got our diving license, scuba diving license in Brazil. But yes. that's about all I, yeah. yeah. That scares me more than do. flying. But, you know, that's, yeah. um, but so we met mm -hmm. and I think hit it off, spent three months together. You'd fly in the mornings, and then I'd we'd hang out. But then I ended up taking a job in Hawaii on the Big Island, trapping mosquitoes. Um, mm. They were testing them for avian malaria. And so then you, I guess we kept in touch for those six months, write letters. Um, CB radio. Yeah. CB, really? Old, CB? old school, yeah. Wow. So you'd call, I would call, um, I'm, I'm living on the banks of a tributary to the Amazon and uh, like thatch, thatch roof imagine it and that's basically what it uh what what it was like and we had a cb radio that decided to call in to the operator in the city which was like being in um kingsville or being in um that part of south texas and calling into san antonio via cb radio the operator would literally like <laughs> dial a number and then connect it and then there was a huge delay yeah and so I would have to speak in Portuguese to the operator, give her the number, and then she would call Chrissy in Hawaii. Yeah. And then it would be like 30 seconds, and then she would say hello, and it would be like a 10-second delay, and then I would say hello. Then we so can only talk hello. for like 15 minutes because it was so expensive. Or right. To, so when, for in, longer, in your yeah. conversation, you had that long a delay, like trying to go back and forth? Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> letters actually were you like primarily some, yeah. how we communicated because – I didn't have access to email. The email was like early days, um, but yeah. also just wasn't in the city for that long mm -hmm. um, in, in, in stints. And so anyway, we kept in touch. And then you came and visited. She came and visited me. And um, I'd had my, my license at that point. I'd bought a plane down there that had been flown in the gold mines like in the 80s and uh, was still operational. And we flew... Uh, to the indigenous reserve. We kind of mm -hmm. flew around all these places. Uh, my thought was we were probably going to get married. <laughs> and so I wanted her to see this part of my life. It was mm -hmm. like, And I wasn't sure if I'd go back. And mind you, we've only known each other. I mean, we, we really spent three months together. And mm -hmm. then I left for Hawaii. And then we talked once a week or maybe in letters. And mm -hmm. then he's like, I want you to come to Brazil. I'm going to quit my job come back to the states but i want you to see what i've been doing for the last three and a half years yeah how cool so we and like had, landed yeah. in the middle of i mean if you look at a map now of the um amazon there's a piece that juts out on the southern end of the basin and uh, it's green and everything around it's brown well that's all been deforested in the brown part and the sliver that's green is this indigenous reserve it's like six million acres they're about 3,000 or so in Indians there in multiple tribes, similar to 
what you might think of like Oklahoma. So they had some indigenous tribes that were there, native to that area, then they brought others from yeah. other parts of the country. And so we landed at one of the dirt strips there and then spent like three or four nights. Mm -hmm. And we traveled by foot and canoe with this tribe uh, Slept to, in to this big ceremony yeah. where they all get together. And um, they're in part um, celebrating um, the the dead. So they all like, you, you see this in other civilizations, I guess, where, where people sort of mourn all at once. Oh, interesting. Uh, so you kind of like get it out of the way, basically. Um, instead of being sad for years, it's like, okay, this person passed away. They sort of um, collect those memories during that period, and then once a year they, they mourn. And then after that, they have this huge, like, WWF brawl, uh, like a cage match. <laughs> like actual fighting? Yeah, <laughs> where the uh, – so they were, like, let's say eight tribes probably, yeah. more or less there. And they're, they're in the middle of this um, – um, of these huts in a big area, probably – three or four football um, field size area that's clean, it's dirt. Mm -hmm. You have these totem poles that, that represent the people that have passed away. And then sitting around the edge of this courtyard, if you will, are the chiefs and the medicine men and then their tribes and then like their best fighters. And they're all painted and you, you can maybe go online and, 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 and see, see some of the photos from this, but they send out one by one their best fighters, and these guys will match up, and it's a much longer description than, than we have here today, but they end up fighting. It's like Greco-Roman style. You basically just have to get to a position um, where you can throw someone down, okay, and then it's over, normally. Uh, <laughs> and, and wasn't the mothers, their mothers were there too, like? Heckling. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And like if I somebody does them. something, yeah. if somebody did something that was like out of uh, character or wasn't um, like part of the, um, uh, they weren't honoring the traditions, then they would, the, the grandmother, or like this so, person who was playing yeah. that role would like really harangue them. <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, and then at the end, towards the end, you sort of like work your way down towards people that are really good to kind of the average um, uh, wrestlers. And then it's a free-for-all. Like then, you know, if, if you and I have been looking at each other, but we haven't been chosen to, to wrestle against each other throughout this whole period, then we, you and I may like lock eyes and it's go get time. after it. <laughs> yeah. So we've got a, a, a picture that I took and Chrissy's in front of the camera and then to the side of her are – all, all these Indians that are dressed in uh, paint and everything. And about 10 yards away, there's a guy pointing back at us at the camera like this. And at the time, I thought You're it like, was oh me. No. Uh, but it's the guy right in front of us. So he's, like, calling him out to come into the ring. Um, so is it strictly a wrestling match, or do they actually punch and kick? No, and it's yeah. all, wrestling. all so, wrestling. So they will get down and face each other and then imitate uh, Jaguar. So they'll grunt and, and, like, kick, and they move around each other, and then they lock up. This um, is your kind of fight. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> no, sign me up. Grant, there was a show. Yeah, you'll have to go <laughs> online. There was a show that was uh, sent fighters, uh, guys from multiple disciplines, from all over the world, around the world, to wrestle and fight and kickbox and stuff with other cultures. And they go to the Shingu. They go to this area where we were. So you can, like, see in oh, part cool. what they they did. This is a few years after we left. Um, but so anyway. At cool. this point, I know you're probably on cloud nine. Like, hey, there's this girl here with me. I think I'm going to marry yeah. her. <laughs> yeah. You're probably like, this is so cool. What in the world is going through your head at this point? I mean. I mean, I like, at that time, you just have no fear. You're up for, I mean, I was game for anything. Because you then said, by the way, I have this plane and I want to fly back to the United States. Do you want to go with me? And I was like, okay. At that point, I mean, I mean, I mean like, yeah. why not? There was no other way back. There was no yeah. other way back. Yeah, and and I don't speak Portuguese, so I couldn't find another way. Um, you had her. It was over yeah, at that point. Yeah. <laughs> but then, so it was twelve days, and you can only fly, you know, four hours at a time before you have to land and and refuel. And so, I mean. 
in all honesty, I think that's like the best way to get to know somebody. I mean, it could have mm -hmm. gone horribly wrong or bad because you're stuck together, you know, for 12 days. I don't speak the language. You're in this tiny plane. Um, but I mean, it worked out. We're still here. What an amazing story. <laughs> I'm jealous. That's awesome how y'all got started and communication was so much different than it is nowadays because today y'all be FaceTiming every day and when you saw each other, you know every single minute of the day like yeah. it is today when we communicate. So we don't have a lot to talk about when we see each other in person. Uh, I know. That's right. Because communication is so easy now. So that's yeah. Really, that's and really I, cool that y'all had that. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I don't recommend that people spend like a month together in the Amazon <laughs> or, or fly in a tin can uh, over the ocean. But – yeah. That like pressure situation mm -hmm. of having to really rely on each other, like for you to keep your cool when things are not going great, mm -hmm. and for me to be able to um, manage the situation, and for us to like communicate with each other and all of that, like yeah. it all comes to a head. And so that kind of prepared us for having kids and working together, yeah. and all that. You can kind of like go back. And look at that time and say, well, if we got through that, like, then the yeah, rest of this is cake. Yeah. Yeah, well, when you travel right. with someone, you really get to know mm -hmm. them, good yeah. and bad. And <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I think that was a good test. Do you still have the letters? Oh, yeah. I kept cool. everything. That's He's awesome. an amazing letter writer. Wow. Really long, like four pages. Uh, it reminds me I, of my grand. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Well, but I'm, I'm not. I think I'd send you, like, a postcard or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was mysterious then, you know, yeah. she's like, ah, a woman of yeah, very few words. <laughs> <laughs> Probably made you just double down, you know, on your letter Yeah, that's writing. right. Okay. Well, I was I gotta, busy. Like, really I was pull this trapping out of yeah. mosquitoes, yeah. I think yeah. it's so cool that you hung yeah. on to those. My uh, my grandfather was a pilot in World War II, and when, when he was over flying in Europe, he wrote a ton of letters, mm -hmm. you know, my grandmother and him, and we have them all, and it's it's cool. You know, I don't um, – can't read their cursive super well, but yeah. you know, we try to get through them, and it's just so neat to see the history there. And it sounds like it gave y'all such a wonderful foundation for the rest of your lives together, which yeah. is just really neat. That's probably one of the most fascinating stories I've heard of a couple connection. Um, that's wonderful. I think I we all, we talk about this a lot, like what my parents were thinking. Yeah, like, sure. <laughs> you know, go Did ahead. Did you tell them? Because, yeah. yeah, and I mean, we have three daughters, and I'm thinking if one of them came to us and was like, I want to go to. Brazil and then fly he's gonna fly me back um, I think you have to no. say yes at this point Sorry, yeah I think I do I think I do <laughs> what um, kind of plane was it a 182, 182. Cessna 182 mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it was like I should know this but I think it was a seven, 1974 maybe I think um, yeah pretty basic yeah yeah I'm saying that's pretty new though the one I've been uh, flying in here recently is the 52 oh, from wow. 56 oh wow <laughs> so it's a oh, I mean wow. it is a literal tin can yeah it still runs yeah for yeah. Now. yeah it's amazing um, it was a really good experience and I think for us to it sort of set a bar for like what our expectations are of each other in our in our lives if mm -hmm. that makes sense mm -hmm. like that we do want to be adventurous, and I think it's easy as you get older, and especially if you, as you have a family, to sort of settle in and, and be okay with what's going on in your life or get caught up. And so I feel like every few years we sort of like snap out of it and say, okay, what are we going to do next? You know, really appreciate things, I guess, and know that that was the way that that all this started. And that you were, I mean, you were in. Hawaii and then after that you went to the Everglades and we're doing work there and then even when we first got married she was doing field work with the Peregrine Fund in Marfa so there was like this expectation and this um, rhythm I guess mm -hmm. of um, both doing conservation work but also kind of giving back and and being a little bit adventurous when we could. How cool. And it sounds like you guys recently had a pretty epic adventure that we'll get to going down the coast but yeah. um so Brazil story, I feel like we've kind of bookend that. What was next for you? I mean, I know you ended up at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and so I'm guessing all of that was probably mid to the late 20s, into your 30s maybe? I mean, what was the next decade like for you? Yeah, we... Well, El Paso. Yeah, yeah. we ended up um, getting married, and then, and then I spent um, a little bit of time on, on the ranch. I hadn't been home for, um, I guess really any extended period of time for 
10 years. And so home so. for you is King Ranch, King Ranch South Texas? Yeah, okay. in, in Kingsville. And, uh, and then we moved to El Paso. I got a job, and it was in real estate. And honestly, I had no clue uh, what I was doing. But I noticed that the people that were visiting us in, in Brazil, a lot of them had been in real estate. Oh, and uh, I thought, okay, well, they've, they have families, and they're still married. Uh, <laughs> they have time. And they have the money. The, the trips that we were doing are relatively expensive. And just because of the resources required, it's in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, and have, they have the resources to do all of this stuff. And they seem to be generally happy. They like the outdoors, all that. So that was, like, how I decided to, uh, to try uh, uh, and get into the real estate business. And so we moved there. Mm-hmm. And I had never been to El Paso and I think I was in Florida at the time, mm-hmm. and you asked me to marry you in Dallas mm-hmm. when we had one weekend together. And sounds right on cue yes. for oh, what I would expect. Yes. <laughs> um, and I said yes, and then went back to Florida, and then you were like, "We're gonna." I got a job in El Paso. You bought a house, never saw it, and then showed up and we were there for six seven almost seven years i think Mm -hmm. absolutely loved el paso really good friends really good people in the community um and then decided it was time for a change and went to business school yeah and that's kind of how we ended up here in austin oh interesting so you decided to go to business school at oh you did it here at ut yeah at ut and yeah in business school i guess i I thought I would focus on real estate, and then I got in and realized that like my competitive advantage wasn't in computer modeling or in a love for real estate per se in buildings or in cap rates or any of that stuff. Um, and I, I and I felt like I couldn't necessarily be like super. Um, not sure that I was super competitive or passionate about it. And being in a high stress situation like that, I think you sort of realize like what you're good and good at and what you aren't. And just realize that you know, I was from Texas and not not as many people were from Texas and had like deep roots there in school. And was just really passionate about conservation related things. And no one in, in business school was at the time. And so I ended up getting an internship with the National Park Service and did a business plan for the Grand Canyon. And um, it's like, okay, I, I like this. There's um, there's real estate. It's a different kind of real estate. It's a million acres and you got a million visitors or so a year there. And um, there's recreation involved. I like that part. There's also some business associated with it. Like how do you deal with visitors and revenue and operations and uh, capital improvements? And like all the water at the Grand Canyon comes from the North Rim in a World War II era pipeline system. Does it really? Like literally the water shoots out of the mountain or out of the, the north rim of the canyon from a spring, and then they pipe it down to the bottom of the, of the canyon, which I think is like, I forget the mileage. It's, it's a mile uh, in elevation drop, and I think it's 20, it's almost a marathon, it's 23 or 4 miles from the tip of the canyon to the other. Mm-hmm. And then they have a bilge pump that's like a World War II era bilge pump that they pump it all up to the South Rim. Anyway, why? And it, I had no idea this. That, that's just how that it developed uh, in the, I guess, in the 40s and the 50s. And uh, the pipe is so old, and it's so dr- the the weather is so extreme there that um, it blows up often. Like water shoots out of the pipe, and it blows donkeys and not people yet, but <laughs> yeah. at, at this point. <laughs> off of the side of the mountain because it's built into the trail. So I was like, this is cool. I get to do a business plan. I get to, like, think about all these, you know, uh, uh, issues and challenges, but it's for for, uh, uh, a good cause. And so then I was kind of asking around with organizations, and I happened – I literally ran into almost um, Carter Smith, who was running Texas Parks and Wildlife Department at the time, and we had a mutual friend. The guy that I was in Brazil with uh, had gone to school with him at UT. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm really passionate about this, but I don't know what to do. I'm, I've asked around, and 
Um, I have kind of a unique background and skill set that doesn't seem to fit exactly anywhere. And the Parks and Wildlife Foundation at the time was looking at raising $130 million over a three-year three, three year period. What year was this? Or this was like uh, 2013. 13, okay. 13, yeah. And met the executive director, Ann Brown, who I still work with today in other capacity. And um, she sort of saw that if they were going to raise this money, they'd done a feasibility study, so they figured they could they could raise it. But they needed a pitch deck, if you will. Um, and I said, well, I just did a business plan for this park. I could translate that to wh how, what you're going to do with this money. And it was going to be land acquisition and a bunch of other things in uh, Texas. And so that's how I got involved in uh, Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. Interesting. How yeah. many? And so did, did you end up going to work there officially? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I was associate director for a number of years, and then – um, I left briefly, like on sabbatical, I guess you could call it, to do the river and the wall with mm -hmm. Ben and that crew. So did you go, just side story, were you with that? Did you go on that whole journey yeah. with them? Okay, yeah. amazing. Yeah, and then uh, when I came back, shifted sort of what I was doing, and I'd really been doing a lot of land-related work. Um, we did a huge, for, for Parks and Wildlife, did a big land transaction on the coast with uh, Deepwater Horizon oil spill funds. Mm -hmm. And so I shifted from associate director to director of conservation and, and then did a bunch of different like special projects. We wor worked with um, HEB this last year, I guess it was, and helped launch uh, the 100th anniversary of state parks. And so I, I stayed involved in, in other ways, but always working for them, wow, know, which is cool, yeah. What was it that initially got you into conservation? I mean, we're, for me, I have a very distinct moment in my life that it kind of clicked for me. Yeah. Um, did you have a distinct moment like that, or is it just kind of in your blood from the get-go? I mean, uh, you had switched majors a few times and then landed on conservation. conservation. Well. Yeah, I, I knew I wanted something, I think, animal, wildlife related, but didn't know until, I, I guess I didn't know until I was international business major because I thought that's what I needed to go to college and do. Just say, same for you with like mm -hmm. real estate. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, oh, there's a wildlife and ag department here and kind of just fell into it wow. and did wanted to do field research. It just kind of um, clicked for you? Yeah. 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 I liked, I, just, I liked the field work aspect of it, just being out outdoors and collecting the data. Um, so I kind of just fell into it and have, have stuck with that. Very cool. And I, I don't know. I think for you it's always been like something in the back of your mind that you've wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, I grew up yeah. where I grew up and around biologists and outdoors most of the time. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't know that until, until going to Brazil and sort of seeing, like, I think for t in Texas we sort of take – for granted the fact that we have this conservation ethic in the United States certainly but mm -hmm. that we care enough about it to conserve it mm -hmm. and there are mechanisms to do that and you can do it in perpetuity in most instances um, and in Texas it's a unique situation because we're 95 percent privately owned and so you really are relying on 95 percent of the landowners to care enough to conserve native habitat and care about wildlife and water resources and all those things mm -hmm. like it's a it's not written anywhere that anybody really needs to do that it's kind of a unique situation and so I don't know that I really fully appreciated that until I went to Brazil I'm sure it's very stark there because you have rainforest and dirt and there's probably I've seen photos where in some places it's a literal just line mm -hmm. yeah where you can see the difference there and you fly over it oh very yeah. true yeah and for, you know, when we, when I first got there and when, the couple that I was with, they were, had already been there for almost a decade, but, you know, imagine driving from Austin to Corpus and there are a hundred foot tall trees and forest lining the road for four hours plus actually, like go all the way to Brownsville. Mm -hmm. uh, and then every five years, every hundred miles uh, is clear cut. And so 
I saw that just in the little time that I was there and then now fly it. So now you have a much larger perspective and you realize what's well, not just along the sides of the road. It's actually these huge swaths, like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of acres that are being deforested. Mm -hmm. And then come the fall when they've, they've felled trees and then burned them. And there's a, a reason for all of this. Um, the smoke runs from the Amazon all the way to Sao Paulo, so like 2,000 miles. Wow. So you have to you have to have a instrument rating. Oh, wow, because of the smoke. Literally, to fly. <laughs> so I'm seeing this like on a really large scale, and I wouldn't consider myself a tree hugger like by, uh, I wouldn't label myself that, that way, but I certainly care about the environment mm -hmm. and our natural resources, and I understand there are forces outside of our control that that are the reason for these things but I thought if I can't it's this is very hard to to like prevent honestly um, and it's such a huge scale and Brazil is in such a different um, a different point in their um, history than we are uh, we did it I mean we deforested the east coast mm -hmm. right and then it really not until if you've read um, some of the books on um, uh, the development of the national forests and all that and teddy roosevelt and national parks and everything that would those were all novel ideas that we shared this common resource and that we would protect them not for private interest but for the common good and those mechanisms don't really exist in it at scale outside of the United States. There are some areas, right, like in Africa where you've got preserves and things, but it's different. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a very long answer. But yeah. I, I guess I saw what could be um, in Brazil and realized that I could spend my whole lifetime, and if you get it in the wrong political cycle or the wrong economic cycle, um, everything that you've worked for literally goes up in flames. Wow. Um, and so I just thought more about home and like what we have in this tradition and, and there's still work to do. And I guess that part I didn't realize. I mean, I grew up on this very large landscape thinking that that's the way you just don't see development much down in mm -hmm. South Texas. There's this 2 million acre, what, what some call like the last great habitat because it's intact. Um, but you start driving, driving around the state like we have over the last five or ten years, and you know it's not just in the cities. Like you see, you see the landscape being fragmented, and um, and so I guess I, that was probably the the turning point. And then yeah. in business school for me, it was like if I'm going to dedicate, if I have these now, now I have these tools. Um, I have an understanding of business because I've been in that arena. I have these resources. I have a degree. Uh, I'm not just a writer. Um, now, like, let me do something with this. And you let me do it in a it, way yeah. that I don't yeah. think anybody else, it certainly, like, it, in the folks that I was with, they just didn't, they weren't passionate about it. And that was the other thing I realized. Like, people that are, that I feel like are successful are really very passionate. And when they wake up in the morning and they ask themselves, why the fuck am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Like, they have an answer for it. Um, and it's and they never question that. And well, I think having that that passion for something it, it helps you get through all the difficult times. Totally. I mean, it, when you don't want to get up in the morning, it's that burning drive you have to have to get you up and actually push through the hard times, or you don't have enough money. There's that. Like the passion can almost outweigh all of the other negatives. Yeah. It's, I've, I've noticed that with successful people as well. Yeah. That that's a really common thing amongst almost all of them. Yeah. And I wouldn't like put ourselves in the successful category, but. I think we strive to be that, and then, and and I think our definition is probably different mm -hmm. um, than maybe it would have been. I don't know. At least for me, like in my twenties, in part, that's why I pursued this real estate um, path, career path, because like financially, I want to be. That's what I want to be is financially successful, um, like that above all else. And then I realized. Um, and I'm sure people that have gone through now the pandemic, for us, it was a recession in 2008, like makes you realize, oh, wait, like this could all just evaporate. And so what have I done the last mm -hmm. four, five, ten years? And if it's all dependent on 
financial success and that can just go away then then maybe i need to like recalibrate a little bit it's a great way of looking at it yeah for me on conservation you know growing up here in austin i spent a ton of time in the green belts my i was fortunate mm-hmm. that my house just always backed up and my, the rule for me was you come home when the street lights turn on and so yeah. my childhood was spent in the woods but i really had no appreciation for it i mean i think inherently i kind of did but it wasn't really in front of mind You know, went to high school, went to college, didn't really think about conservation, nature, none of it wasn't even on my radar. Um, But then I came home and uh, this was 2018. It's a bit of a long story, but I just I randomly started this. I got into landscape photography. So that kind of was the first step of like, oh, this is cool. I'm out taking photos. And so I started hiking more and um, try. I was trying to hunt down waterfalls. I want to do the long exposure Mm -hmm. shots. And, you know, and so I was chasing all those down. Still didn't really care about nature that much as far as like thinking about it like sure. it was there but it wasn't in front of mind um but i started this instagram account called hike austin where i would just share different photos from different people different parks again not really thinking too much of it it just kind of happened but it had pretty much instant success i mean i just i was averaging 100 new followers a day so the account within weeks was just climbing i'm like holy cow like i'm onto something people mm-hmm. want this information um, and again, was just posting whatever I could find good content on. But it hit me one day. I posted this little neighborhood park, you know, behind people's house, really not set up to have masses of people mm-hmm. going there. And it and it, it just popped off. It had you know ten thousand likes or something, mm-hmm. and I think three thousand people saved it. Another four thousand sent it to a friend, and that was one of the first posts. I was like, holy cow! Like I might have just sent thousands of people. <laughs> To this little green yeah. belt like what am i doing mm-hmm. and it just like it was just so clear to me like yeah. in that moment of like whoa i have a responsibility here i didn't realize that i had mm-hmm. and so i immediately picked up the phone called texas parks and wildlife mm-hmm. austin parks lcra parks mm-hmm. travis county parks and i said am i do you want me doing <laughs> yeah. this you know like is this a good thing or yeah. not and they all were like well heck yeah like yeah. we survive on people coming here mm-hmm. like yes please we love what you're doing like please keep doing it um, and it just clicked for me and I was like, oh, wow, like I have a responsibility here. It actually is beneficial if I do it correctly. Um, and so then I quit posting places that can't handle having people. They're not set up yeah. for it, you know. And yeah. so my pri- my personal account, I'll post them. I just don't share the location. I'm like, hey, if you find it, great. I want you to go find yeah. it, but I'm not going to tell you where it is. Right. Yeah. And then the parks I would post about. Um, and then from there, my wheels just started turning. And come to the day, I serve on the board of three different nonprofits here in Austin and, and uh very heavily involved in conservation but it's like a it just clicked all of a sudden i think most people it's in there inherently we all Mm -hmm. have it it just kind of takes a reference point or an understanding or like what happened to the to the bison in america Mm -hmm. people have no idea and then like you can have these little moments it's like a light bulb goes off and so i'm always curious with people if like if you had that moment or not sounds like with you guys it was kind of baked in a bit so a little bit yeah yeah that's an interesting a couple of things like I, I get energy both from people, but also from being out in the middle of nowhere mm-hmm. without people. Uh, and like this morning, I was in the green belt with a friend, and we saw maybe two people there. And selfishly, I love it. Like I love that there were only two other people there. But then, obviously, for the benefit of the resource and just for mm-hmm. human beings, the benefit of their own health, like I want more people out there. And so it's an interesting thing, like that, that selfishness of like, you know what you get from it. You want others to share it. But at the same time, when you, it's time for you to go share it, <laughs> you want it to be, you know, yeah. all, all your yeah. own. Um, I was fishing the other day. I've got a little honey hole near my house I like fishing at. And I went to post about it and I was like, oh, no, oh, no. this is my <laughs> spot, you know? <laughs> yeah. It is. It's a double edged sword. Yeah. Yeah. I think the same thing happens with the amount of private land that we have. Mm-hmm. It's challenging. On one hand, it's awesome because it's it's mostly protected. Yeah, please, water's for you. And, yeah. um, oh, and it's protected. So it's great. And I think that the majority of landowners, I think, do a pretty good job of being stewards of the land. I'm sure there's you know plenty of examples that don't. But as a whole, I think there being that much land in Texas is probably a net positive. But on the other hand, it's tough when you want to go hike and you're in Austin, you want to go hike for a weekend, you have to make a reservation six weeks out. Like right. yeah. that's insane. And so yeah. for me, I'm hoping that the continued press that I put onto these parks long term will equal more parks. Mm-hmm. And you know, and I think the state getting a billion dollars in funding, which is incredible. I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts on yeah. that. And so for me I'm like, keep packing the parks full of people mm-hmm. and let's let's raise some some fuss here and let's in, incentivize 
private landowners to, you know, I think there's a lot of landowners that do a great job of conservation easements. We're seeing more and more mm -hmm. of that going on, which is wonderful. But I'm really a big com component for me and what I hope in my time in conservation, at least locally, is I would love to help inspire landowners to actually do the conservation easement great but take it to another step and work with the state park system they have mm -hmm. major funds now lcra is looking for more parks travis county's i mean they all are and so i really hope that the the downside of parks being totally packed and it's difficult to get in will equal more parks and yeah. so that's yeah. kind of the hill i'm going to try to die on but i don't hopefully it works in the long run yeah. yeah i mean i think that's happening i think it was wishful thinking until that billion dollars and that's not enough to solve the the problem mm -hmm. um necessarily of public access but honestly it's one of the things that i think we didn't realize that became a realization in in walking the texas coast is that's a public space mm -hmm. i mean there's an easement that allows all of us to access the beach along the entire coast the the entire coast. coast is there really Wow. And the it's open part beaches of the Open Beaches Act, Act. Yeah. yeah. And there are few other states, Oregon and Hawaii, mm -hmm. that purport to have open beaches, like their whole coastline. But I think there are some exceptions in both of those cases. Whereas in Texas, I think that's you, – you made a point, too, about, like, baseline and people not knowing that we had so many bison or even that – I mean, we were telling someone just a few months ago – that uh, a lot of the stock for repopulating uh, turkey, rear grand turkey and white-tailed deer, when they, their populations had been decimated in the early 1900s, came from South Texas. Well, the I population's thought, coming back, as in like the yeah, population so of South Texas started coming back Yeah, so we transported uh, healthy populations of white-tailed deer and rear grand turkey out of South Texas Interesting. into the hill country and other places that had been uh, overhunted. What time frame was that? that this we... is in the turn of the century, so okay. like 19, early 1900s. Okay. Um, this is during market hunting days and lack of regulation, and so that's what ultimately we had the Oyster Fish and Game Commission in part. There was the oyster part of it because we had an abundance of oysters in Texas, and then for a variety of reasons, over harvesting being a big one, they dropped the oyster part of it and then added parks, so it became Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. Oh, interesting. But the reason why there's no oyster is because they realized at that time, this was, I'm going to be off, but I think in the 50s, um, as a decline, we really saw the end of uh, the height of uh, oyster harvesting uh, and population in Texas in the mid-80s, but by the 50s, they realized this is sort of a dying industry, and so we're just going to, like, even strip our uh, agency that's regulating it. We're going to strip the, the name Oyster from it. But thinking about, like, a baseline, I think that's part of why we wanted to walk the coast is not many people know, even you, didn't think about the, our beaches as this public space. I had no idea. I had and, no idea. Yeah. And, I don't and think many people it's something very it. unique to Texas. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing more and more population growth, certainly in Harris County, but just as you move down the coast, it'll, it'll be developed in these barrier islands that serve a natural purpose um, against rising seas and storms and all that. They're, they're developed. You look at Galveston and Bolivar mm -hmm. Peninsula and South Padre Island, um, but you have Padre Island National Seashore, which has been permanently protected, and it's the uh, part of the longest unde undeveloped barrier island in the world. Mm -hmm. Is it really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. So all of these cool things that even, I mean, I grew yeah. up near there, right? I grew up in Kingsville, which is technically on the coast, and you spent a lot of time, both of us driving around Texas, um, that that we wanted a snapshot in time for people to see that this is what it was like, right? Um, and educate them, make them aware. They're going to go, you know, like if you, if, if you market it, like you're saying about these – parks mm -hmm. people will go and hopefully they go right because you want them to have the same experience that you you do and and it, you want them to, to care about these places and seeing it on a mo in a movie or on a tv or an instagram or something is one thing but actually like going and experiencing it mm -hmm. is another and so um that was in part why we decided to walk the whole the whole coast well let's dive into it a little bit and so i know you have a film coming out about you so as you two walk the entire texas coastline mm -hmm. It sounds like to 
set a baseline, raise awareness of what's going on. You know, in the last several years, um, I've learned a lot about Central Texas conservation issues that we have. Beyond that, I'm totally lacking. And mm -hmm. so I would love if you guys just want to give high level about the film, um, kind of set it up for folks, and then I'd really like to dive into what you found along the journey. I don't know, give away any secrets from the film, but you sure. know, I know nothing about the Texas coast. I know redfish almost went away and now they didn't we have the cca to thank for that but yeah. beyond that i'm lacking so please educate me if you can yeah Good. well i think it you first had the idea and presented it to me <laughs> in our bar in, in, a mexico. Ba in mexico city i think we were that trying sounds to, just I, perfect yes. for how <laughs> i think we were trying to figure out what to do next um and again i'm like sure that sounds awesome you are like, a trooper I, just every time you're just ready to go sure yeah. um I, I love the coast but like you said I really only had been to maybe Port Aransas or like a spring break at South Padre you know but don't know didn't know much about the upper coast mid coast area um and then we thought well no you know nobody's ever walked the whole thing that we had found and so of course I'm like yeah that sounds amazing like if we can make it work with three kids, like we get three weeks together, you know, like you had mentioned before, it was like a good way to reconnect, have another adventure. It's been a long time since we've had a, had a good adventure like that. Um, and then we weren't going to film it. We kind of thought about it, but then we didn't want that added pressure to have to have to deal with that. But you happen to be in a meeting with PBS here in Austin. Yeah, the Austin PBS was thinking about creating a content fund. So the four of us want to make a movie or a film series or something, but all we have is an idea, and it's hard to sort of figure out, well, who's going to help us produce it, or can we get some startup funds to put a pitch deck together or whatever. And so they were thinking about the creation of this, and I knew some people there. They called me in. And uh, I'm not sure I was very helpful, uh, but at the end of it, they said, well, have you come across any projects recently? I said, <laughs> well, well yeah. <laughs> actually, yeah. I was, we were thinking about doing this, but uh, I know that distribution, getting people to see a film is, at least in my limited experience, is the hardest part. You do all of this, it's like writing a book or something, mm. like this is gonna be awesome. And then how do you get people to, to read it or watch it? And so they said, this sounds great. And in fact, we think that you could focus on this and this and this. And, and if you come back to us in 30 days with a proposal, uh, let's see what, what, we, what we can do. And so we went and talked with uh, John Aldrich, who had edited The River and the Wall. And then we went to Skip Hobby, mm -hmm. who was the um, director of photography for Deep in the Heart, and then has, has done a, a lot of other things but they know more about all this than we do. We talked to Ben Masters and his team about the idea, and he was filming um, American Southwest and then Deep in the Heart 2, and so there was a little bit of synergy there. Like, we were going to be out on the coast. We could maybe share some footage. He was going to do some stuff on whooping cranes and oysters. And so, yeah, we came back to Austin PBS and said, this is the plan. We think we can... Initially, we thought we could do all of it in, like, um, three months. Yeah. Like, raise the money, Holy which would be half a million dollars, and do the walk, and put together a film. And uh, everybody yeah. except me was like, you're crazy. And I'm glad they did, because that was not a good time. I was going to say, how long did it take it, to actually hike it? I mean, was, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this that was all, three like, weeks. December. Three weeks, okay. Yeah. I think you wanted to walk in April. Yeah. Which, it was, it's still hot in April. Oh, I mean, yeah. it was still hot in October, too, when we did it. But there was no way we could have put that all together um, in three months. Yeah. So we then decided we'd do it in October mm -hmm. of like this last year of 2023. Uh, we figured at first I thought we could do 26 miles a day. And then that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. yeah. I, then, I had to put my foot down. Even so just finally. on a normal trail, that's <laughs> a lot, let alone yeah, on the beach, you know? Yeah. yeah. And weather yeah. and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. And so we cut that back by uh, six miles average. So we did, we ended up averaging 20 miles a day. Wow, that's still over quite a bit. A, actually 20 days, 20 of, walking, days of walking. We had one day yeah. off. So three weeks total. Mm -hmm. uh, and spent 
January through September doing like B-roll and interviews and um, well filming all the stories I think we wanted to tell I think the first was Redheads mm -hmm. um, down in South Texas and then we went to Galveston there's the Ghost Wolves I don't know if you know of Ghost Wolves which are they have uh, red wolf DNA coyotes that have red wolf DNA that these two female scientists have been studying for years. Oh, I think that's like the the mixed breed between coyotes and wolves. Yeah. I think I have Basically, heard about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's not chupacabra, is it? It's no. no. <laughs> They're much cooler than that, yeah. actually. So you, had, so you had stories kind of identified as you went yeah. through the coast of what you wanted to highlight as you went through? Yeah, chrono mm -hmm. you, you can sort of like look at the coast. We decided as a team to do it north to south because you'd have a – just because of the way that we felt the story would, would work. Well, I'd much rather end at South Padre than Louisiana. Yeah, than Louisiana. So I think yeah. That's, yeah one yeah. of our team members' yeah. idea, yeah. Uh, which is a good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you can kind of make your way down the coast and say, okay, let's focus on this area, do a little bit of research. I think the two of us and some of the team sort of knew some things like High Island, which is a, a huge uh, birding um, attraction up in the north of Galveston area. Uh, on so Bolivar Peninsula, okay. which is another cool place that nobody knows about. Never heard but of it. Yeah. People from all over the world come during April when the spring migration is coming through to see warblers. And that was fascinating because mm -hmm. nobody – it's a beautiful – Houston Audubon manages this one, Smith Oaks. And I met people from everywhere wow. when we were there filming for a week. And they're like, you don't – you've never been here before? And I was like, no, I – I didn't know much about it either, and I'm from Texas. Mm -hmm. And they were coming from Japan, Sweden, Holy everywhere. Cow. All to watch birds? All to watch, yep. yeah, cool. these warblers and other songbirds that are migrating through. 600 miles from the Yucatan across the Gulf at night. They fly straight. The birds yeah. are doing mm -hmm. Holy cow. Overnight, yeah. Yeah, not, not the birders. Yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. uh, I've gotten more into birds <laughs> in, the, in the last couple of years, but I – Birding needs a, a new branding campaign because calling yourself a birder yeah. or going birding mm -hmm. is still a struggle for me. And <laughs> yeah. so I still refuse to talk about it much. They need a, they need a new marketing campaign around yeah. birding. Yeah. yeah, I mean, but it's blowing up. I, I mean, I feel like there are a lot more people now interested. It's yeah. fascinating. It, it I've is. only heard bird watching. Heard yeah, birding. birders. Yeah. Birders. Heard that yeah. Before. yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's the, what I said, too, because <laughs> I've more worked with hawks and raptors <laughs> and the big ones that are easy easier mm -hmm. for me to identify. Mm -hmm. And so it was a whole new world, uh, you know, with the people that were coming to visit there. And I remember filming, and, we, you know, you have this, like, giant long lens and I'm on this beautiful red bird and they come to me they're like oh you look serious like what is that like they, they're thinking <laughs> that it's like some rare you know you're like, gonna some drop I'm this scientific got, name yeah. or something. and I'm like it's a bird it's, yeah. it's, it's a warbler I was like I don't know what you it is you could have gotten just the last red I know the last, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but immediately you know they look up in their yeah. binoculars and in like a second they can identify yeah. it you know and so I've learned a lot from them and from that experience there and also uh, filming too, like yeah. somebody would say, "Oh my God, you got to go see this Cape May over here. It's 500 yards yeah. that way, and go around there." And you're like, "Oh, we've got to go film that." But saying that you need to go do something and then actually being able to capture it on film are two totally different things, and making it interesting yeah. is a whole other thing. And I learned that a little bit from from Ben. Like we'd be talking with folks, and they he'd ask, you know, what is something we should go film, and they'd say Serpulid Reefs. This guy said from CCA, Serpulid Reefs in Baffin Bay. Well, Serpulid Reefs don't move, and you have to have microscopic cameras mm -hmm. to even see mm -hmm. what's inside of them. These, like, ancient worms that um, have created this uh, reef or rock system in, in Baffin Bay that only exists in one other part of the world, which is in Ireland. Wow. And uh, so you're like, okay, well, that sounds cool, the way that I describe it to you, but then putting that on on the camera on film is like a totally different thing and so yeah you, you learn to like filter what birders are saying mm -hmm. uh, is cool birders. well birds are birders. hard to shoot too i mean not oh, literally but but the yeah. camera i mean they're yeah um they just they're they move so fast and get in your focus and those long lenses it's so hard to get your place i mean they're pretty yeah. tricky to do it almost need, you almost need like a little bird blind where you have watering hole st you yeah know, camera on a tripod yeah. and, and capture them well and that's why Br uh, high island and smith oaks is so cool because it's uh, there you're up in the canopy they've built this boardwalk and so you're kind of at eye level with a lot of the birds wow. but like 
when you have a huge lens to try to, and they move, they're just like, poof, 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 poof. Mm -hmm. and you're so like the whole time, <laughs> if you look at the footage, you're just like trying to capture it. Yeah. And by the time you get it, you maybe are about to get it in focus and it like mm -hmm. takes off again. Yeah. So that was a fun experience. Um, the largest public works project oh, that yeah. the Army Corps of Engineers has ever undertaken is, is um, ha planned for the Galveston Bay area. What are they doing? Like north of $40 billion, more or less. Holy cow. Mm -hmm. A big dike system mm -hmm. um, to protect Galveston Bay. So we talked to engineers and folks that are supporting that and some people that um, think it's a bad idea. Mm -hmm. um, that's the largest between Houston and Port Arthur. It's the largest petrochemical complex in the world there. And then you kind of make your way down the coast and high rates of erosion, some of the highest rates of erosion in the country are on the Texas coast. I think that's about all I know about coastal issues as of today is like it's eroding away. Erosion, yeah. yeah. Okay. So we're, as a state and with federal support, are um, having to kind of remake natural processes. And so we're dumping sand offshore that millions of years ago, well, actually like more than 30,000 year, 30, years ago or so, the sea was further out, like 100 miles or so from the current coastline. And so as it rose, it left some of these old river deltas. And so we're taking sand from those old river deltas. So you, you've got sand that it would, would have come down the Brazos or the Trinity or name your river. Um, and so we're replicating uh, what used to be these natural uh, processes where sand would move around the coast uh, and dumping you know, millions of cubic yards on our on our beaches on, a, on an annual basis just to like keep up with those erosion rates. What's causing the erosion? I mean, is it man-made or is it a natural? So you got lack of sediment. So we dammed up all our rivers in the 50s, basically. So you don't have as much sediment coming down river and into the Gulf. Um, you still have sediment coming down the Mississippi, but longshore drift doesn't necessarily take care of all that. And then we hardened our passages. Uh, so all the, now they're ship channels, but all oh, the natural passes, all the we put jetties up. So those jetties go out for upwards of a mile. So if you can imagine, you know, the water's coming, or the currents are coming down or up the coast, carrying stuff with it and they hit the jetties, and then that sediment builds up there rather than building up on beaches naturally. And then on top of that, you've got rising seas, and so if you look at Galveston and some of the reporting and even the research that's been done, some of the highest rates of sea level rise are right there um, at, in Galveston. And then you've got subsidence, so you've got areas of the upper coast that are sinking because uh, we've taken water or um, minerals out of the pore space. So all of these things are, are happening. It's complicated. It's complicated. Yeah. And then we've built, like in Galveston, you've built on top of a barrier island that traditionally was like a speed bump for hurricanes and extreme weather. So wash over the, the barrier island and you sort of protect the bays and everything behind it. And now we've built on it. So these barrier islands that maybe have dunes that might move a little bit with the hurricane here or there, they're hardened. And so they erode away more quickly, mm -hmm. and then you have people that get in the way and infrastructure and roads that have been washed out and stuff. Um, so it's kind of esoteric, and hopefully you guys aren't, like, um, falling asleep as we talk about this. <laughs> but I, I, I could, e e any one of those points, <laughs> I would be more than happy to take a 30-minute tangent and go down them, you know. So I'm trying not to, so to be so honest. So the, <laughs> the challenge is going to be in this film is, like, I think I'm – I think more in PowerPoint. Uh it's like, okay, I want to give you all the information. I want to make sure that it's accurate and all that. Um, and that's really why we did, I don't know, a dozen or more interviews. Um, and we actually went back to PBS after we finished and said, we actually think we have a series here, not just an hour-long film. And so they agreed to that. So we're, we're wow. doing a six-part series. So Chasing the Tide's not going to be just a film. It's going to be a six-part series. Six-part series. Wow, how yeah. cool. Awesome. Yeah. So. Well, as we were walking, I kept thinking, man, how are we going to – I think every day I'm like, God, how are we going to fit – Summarize this to so, an hour. So, <laughs> yeah, all this info, everything that we're doing, you know, plus all the stuff we just filmed for the last year and what we're doing on the walk, how are we going to fit it into, like, a 54-minute film? And it's kind of – I feel like you, we would do a disservice if we just – 
kind of touched on these things. I'm glad y'all are breaking it up. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully that gets, you know, more momentum behind it and people want to tune in and we can talk about more things. I think series um, right now, too, are just kind of yeah. hot. I mean, people like being able to go and watch six hours of something over an hour. So I think that yeah. was a great move. Yeah. Yeah. We sort of all agreed at the, the last day we were kind of talking about it. Remember, yeah. we were at SpaceX there at um, Boca Chica near Brownsville. And we were just like had just the, the previous day had done a walking interview. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing when you're just doing one thing how much you absorb we were able to literally go almost hour by hour and like we saw this and we saw that and over a three hour long interview we basically like narrated the whole series (laughs) and we got to the last day and and thought gosh I mean we we've actually seen a lot here over 370 miles the the coast really does change quite a bit as you go up and down Um, so you could do more than six I know, but yeah. that costs more money. I know. And time. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm over here like, I know, give me 10. I want to yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, yeah, we've got that, and then we're finishing up a book as well, which will be part journal from that um, journey and part natural history of a lot of the things that we've talked about here. And um, so we'll ho- that will all come out with a series. and. And then hopefully we raise awareness for a lot of the organizations mm-hmm. like you mentioned Houston Audubon and Galveston Bay Foundation and Heart Research Institute and Parks and Wildlife Foundation and CCA, all these groups that are doing good work. Um, and maybe uh, work in, in concert with an organization that I'm running, Gulf of Mexico Trust, on um, what we th- we're going to build the largest trash cleanup in the world. Uh, and Very cool. do it based on watershed. So connect people in Dallas to where their trash ends up if they don't put it in a landfill or recycle it. How which interesting. Is the Actually show them where it's going. Yeah. So, so wow. Dallas and then the end of the watershed would be in, in the Galveston area um, or Port Arthur and then kind of work your way down um, and work with river authorities and uh, maybe some sponsors to just raise awareness. We've got 10 times more trash on Texas beaches than any other coastline, at least in the United States. And a lot of that's not just the 30 million Texans that are contributing to it, but people from around the world's trash ends up in the Gulf Mm. because of the way that the currents work. Mm. And they tend to move westward, and we're sort of the backstop uh, there, so we saw stuff from Cuba. We saw refugee boats from Cuba. Bunch of boats washed up. Um, yeah, I think that was the most fascinating thing for me. Like I got, I be kind of became obsessed with beach combing and all the things. You see what you're finding. See yeah. what you're finding. Wow. And so like, we laugh because a lot of the times, you know, we had GPS trackers and would track our mileage every day. And I think I always had more than you because I was going exactly. up into the dunes. Cause you know, we, it's, it's easy. It was kind of relatively easy walking just on the packed sand. But once you, it's hard once you're walking in like, you know, in the dune area or in just like the regular sand. And so, yeah, there's footage of me kind of going like this and I would just shove everything I found in your backpack. Um, but just stop finding the stuff from all over the world and you find these sea beans and these pods that you know are coming from Africa and wow. South America and just cans like food and, and different things that you knew for sure were not here in the United States. I had no idea that happened yeah. on our mm-hmm. coastline. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did y'all have any problems with landowners crossing, you know, if they owned property that bordered up to the beach? No. In fact, um, even in Houston, well, it's like- legally, if, as long as we're on the wet sand, we're we're uh, on public property. You're not trespassing. You're, you're, you're on, yeah. uh, on um, yeah. on public property. But once you get off that, um, it's the there's an easement in Texas between that wet sand and line of vegetation. So that's the technically the easement, and um, there is one place where it's completely privately owned and there's no uh, other public access. There's not like a road or a bridge or anything to that particular island. And so to make sure we didn't get shot, 
Yeah. Uh, we reached out because we did that during the River and the Wall. I mean, the River and the Wall was El Paso to Brownsville on the Rio Grande. And other than Big Bend State Park and National Park and then some, some other stuff down like near Amistad and the Rio Grande Valley, it's all private land. And so that we made sure that um, we contacted as many private landowners that we could so we didn't. Um, How were they when you called? Good. Yeah, they were Thanks supportive. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Thanks for calling. That was it. Yeah. So same thing. In fact, one of on this trip, um, one of them came out and, and offered us water and, and stashed it for us. He, and yeah, because it was 20 miles. Is yeah, it was that, 20 that miles. That island is 20 miles. Was um, hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah. I just I'm laughing because there's I don't know if you know San Jose Island which is above uh, Mustang Island, Port Aransas okay, yeah. area, and they have a ferry that you can take from. People go over there and they do some beach combing and kind of hang out on that um, kind of is it western? It's west right there. Um, that in there and then they go back and the ferry runs. But we got dropped off like on the north end. Um, and made our way down and you have to have a ticket and so we were waiting in the line to get on the ferry and we were like wait a minute are they gonna let us on because we don't we only have a one way oh, you know yeah. we didn't start like refugees at, yeah. yeah and then they were so confused they were like wait wait you don't have a ticket and like no we walked from 20 miles from the other end to get here um and so luckily they let us on and then I told the captain after we got off that yeah. we didn't have a round trip. We just had one. And he said, I'm so glad you told me that because I would have assumed that we had someone still left on that island and we would have been searching. Two people may have been uh, left behind. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that How they would have not yeah. come back for. But, like, the, in that instance, I mean, yeah, we just told them that we were going to be there. Um, and they were nice, nice about us, about it. And we had support. It was sort of like – a little bit Forrest Gump-ish is mm-hmm. as we made our way down the coast, Chrissy and we had somebody else, Stephanie DeWaters, that was helping us with social media. People were finding out about the the journey, and so they would come out or they were waiting for us to come into the town or, or get close and meet us on the beach. We had a couple of um, Jeep clubs and 4 by 4 rescue clubs 4 by 4 rescue clubs out. yeah, yeah. Wow. that came out some families yeah. uh, a homeschool family that were studying the environment that month yeah. and had been camped in that spot on Mustang Island for a day mm-hmm. waiting for us oh, cuz wow. the kids had questions for us <laughs> <laughs> the first one was why walk why yeah why are you walking? <laughs> that's such a yeah. Yeah. great kid question yeah. but yeah. also so legitimate yeah, yeah, yeah it's it, true. It, it stumped the two of us yeah like, yeah uh, probably could have just driven this thing i know get some dirt bikes or something yeah Yeah, right and we ran go ahead well no no no. well i i think what's people don't think about of how is how logistically hard it is to do something like that because there's 15 passes that you have to cross and so we didn't when we're looking at it and planning it like it looks one way on a map but then when you get there you realize oh well the river, it's wider than what you thought. We thought we could wade it. It looked like it was shallow, but then you get there and it's like a rushing river. Mm-hmm. And so you kind of have to just on the spot change your plans and just find somebody that could give you a boat ride across mm-hmm. or the guy that we just jumped in the back of his truck and <laughs> he ferried us over our over that water yeah. crossing. Um, which was, which I thought that was kind of the coolest part is like how nice and helpful people were and how Texans it just, you know, I think that way being in Texas, um, just how everyone's willing to help you mm-hmm. um, That's amazing. when you're kind of stuck. Yeah. So that was my next question. It was kind of the logistics of it. I mean, were you camping, hotels, food, water, the film crew? I mean, how did, how was that set up? Yeah. Well, initially we were going to, um, camp the whole time. And then we realized we got all this equipment and mm-hmm. we've got other people. And so that we scratched that. And then, then we thought, well, we'll get a travel trailer because Christy's dad has a travel trailer that's been sitting around um, his yard. And so then we realized, wait a minute, there are only three beds here and there are like five of the crew. Yeah. And no one knows how to drive <laughs> this thing. They don't know how to pull it. And so yeah. really, I mean, you figured out pretty much every – 30 miles or so even if we had to backtrack we could stay in an airbnb okay and Mm -hmm. so for the most part we we did that and we had some friends that had houses here and there and so they 
let us stay. Mm -hmm. And then we just identified, we sort of broke it up into 20 mile segments and figured out, okay, what, what's our shot list per day based on the surroundings and what we're gonna be doing. We had a, um, what we call like a line producer that drove the vehicle and made sure everybody had what they needed. Um, and then, yeah, we tr tried to set up as many interviews as we could, but even that is challenging because you tell somebody you're gonna be there at 10 a.m. on Monday and you're four hours behind, sometimes that doesn't work well with people's mm -hmm. schedules. Yeah. And so we did do some interviews along the way, had some support from some state agencies, some federal agencies well, with Ellis, permitting and things mm -hmm. like that. Ellis Pickett. Yeah. He went. Yeah, and then we had a guy who uh, uh, helped establish the, the Texas chapter of Surfrider Foundation and their purpose, I think they, they started in California, but basically they're for beach access. Uh, so imagine a surfer, they want beach access, and that's essentially what this individual who's from Liberty, Texas, which is like east, kind of east Texas, not too far from um, the Port Arthur and Houston area, really has been fighting for for the last 30 or 40 years. It's wow. just as a private citizen. And um, there are more chapters now in Texas. There's one in Brownsville. There's one in Corpus. And uh, we had run into, at the suggestion of a friend, a guy down in South Padre who had paddleboarded the whole coast Holy cow. with his then wife. Yeah, south. To who's, his north. wife got blown off of her stand-up paddleboard in the first six hours of their trip but, yeah. by a shark, <laughs> and then they kept going. They did it, yeah. Uh, and she so just got like, back okay, on that thing? Got back on yeah. and kept going. What in the world? So like, if these people have. can do yeah. it, we're, we're good. <laughs> I've never uh, heard sharks going after paddleboarders. She was in a patch. She was at um, uh, the, uh, Mansfield Spire? Cut. Is that what it was? Yeah, okay. I believe so. Or Brazos Santiago Pass. That place. One of those two. Yeah. Yeah, South, South Padre area. And uh, Ellis, the guy that we ended up getting introduced to, told us a story because he was there. He saw it. Mm -hmm. And then Jean, the guy, uh, hit, her husband said the same thing. Anyway, this guy uh, who'd started this chapter of Surf Rider Foundation, I went and met with, and he said, well, tell me when you're going to be going, and maybe I'll meet up with you guys. <laughs> And, and I kind of forgot about it until about a day before we're on our way to the start. And he said, tell me you know, where you're going to be and what time. And at this point, honestly, when you have your logistical plan set, it's anything that kind of could be an inconvenience is an inconvenience. Mm -hmm. And so I sort of just sort of brushed it off. It's like, hey, it's going to be hard for us to tell you exactly where we're going to yeah. be. And the way you're running down the coast – it's not always easy to get to us. And so he, he met up with us um, on Bolivar Peninsula yeah. right before we got on the ferry to Galveston Island and immediately was like a wealth of knowledge. He knew everybody in the community. We had to find our way through. The, the sea had come up so much that we were tr having trouble actually starting on Galveston Island. Like there was no island to, to walk on. Wow. And so he, he called a county commissioner and said, hey, we got to get these people through this park, which was closed, to get them to the start and all this stuff. We're like, okay, this guy like knows what he's doing. And he just hung with us for We thought it was going to be a few trip. days, and he was with us the whole time. <laughs> yeah. he, he, he ended up walking the whole thing? Drove the whole drove, thing. Oh, drove it. Yeah. yeah, because for the most part, we were alone. Like the, the camera crew, two – folks would like kind of maybe film at the beginning of the day and then at the end and if but if they couldn't meet up with us halfway they would but it nobody was walking with us filming the whole way it was we were alone but Ellis was would drive if he could because I don't think I don't know if, if there was nobody else really had much experience like driving on sand like in right. four-wheel drive and but Ellis, we could trust if we needed anything. He was wow. going to pull up. He was scouting. He was going go and talking ahead. to people. Yeah. So we were like, had become really good friends. And he ended up really following us yeah. the whole mm -hmm. time and slept on couches. And, you know, Ellis. Well, yeah, because I had booked Airbnbs thinking we only yeah. had a certain number of people. <laughs> and then Ellis is like, I need a place to stay. And I'm yeah. like, well, we'll figure something out. We'll sleep on the, he'll sleep on the couch. Yeah. You know, I had forgotten about this until we were, um, looking at, at 
uh, the book in the last couple of weeks. We got to pa Padre Island mm -hmm. National Seashore, and uh, two things had happened. They had a shark-a-thon, like a shark fishing tournament, and when they have those, that's what, 60 miles? It's a 60 mile yeah. stretch all the way from north, the northern part of Padre down to Mansfield Cut. And it can be a pretty narrow like passage and it could be deep sand and they had like torn up the, the road uh, that goes south. And then the tides had come in. So we were planning on camping that section for like four days. Mm -hmm. And we get to the park entrance and they tell us, you can't go any further. Like don't even bother. So we are thinking we've just walked 250 miles, miles or yeah. more and this is it like wow. and that's a big enough section where we're not going to be able to just mm -hmm. skip it and come back later because that's four days and we don't have four days and we're all like down and like what are we going to do and we're calling four by four rental shops and stuff and trying to I'm calling everybody that I know in Corpus and Ellis shows up he's like I'll just drive it and we're like I mean, if you get stuck down there, then we got yeah. another person. So he did it. He drove what was like a six-hour round trip <laughs> he, yeah, down. because it's one way in and one way out. So, like, every day, you know, we'd walk, like, 20 miles and then get picked up, go back out again, and then have to get uh, dropped off the next day at mile 20 and make it to 40. And then somebody has to pick us up, take us all the way back out, Goodness. go back yeah. to 40 miles. I've camped down there before, and yeah. now it's coming back to me. I remember, yeah, it's one way in, and I went like three miles, you know, scared yeah. to go real far. But right. I've also, I, now it's coming back to me that uh, having flats is pretty common down there, too, because mm -hmm. of shells or something. I heard a lot of people, if yeah. you're not on the right tires or something, you can have a lot of issues down there. We, we lucked out. Um, we had two vehicles that were sort of running, running around mm -hmm. that whole time, but... Um, yeah, you sort of put a plan together logistically, and then you plan for flexibility. And we had also just a lot of people that helped us out when when we needed it. Yeah. And um, food, drinks, were offered. Yeah. <laughs> As were fit from fishermen <laughs> and women. Yeah, that were there. Um, but I mean, for the most part, it seemed to go pretty well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, if you when you see it, I don't. It's, it doesn't come across. I'm not sure as as how it happened but day one like we didn't even make 20 miles we made 12, 12. <laughs> so we weren't sure that it was gonna mm -hmm. happen that might be a little nerve-wracking when you're like, yeah. thinking that you're gonna do 20 or 25 a day and then day one you're like wah, wah, with yeah. 12. <laughs> yeah well because it was hot still in october here if you can remember and you have to take an airboat to the start and so, and that first section is not beach that you think of normal beach kind of marshy mm -hmm. And our kids were with us at the start. We got four hours of sleep. And so we made it 12 miles. And I think our crew didn't think we were going to make it. Mm -mm. And you're <laughs> not talking about it either. Yeah. It's like yeah. unspoken. Yeah. Because you, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. And yeah. neither of us, the, either of us had said anything to each other. Um, yeah. And so we, we got up the next day and ended up. It's six o'clock, I guess. The sun's going down, and we're at mile fifteen, and we both kind of like look at each other, and we're supposed to stop there. Mm -hmm. Like, do you want to? I kind of asked it as a question. Do you want to <laughs> keep going? She's like, yes. I think you said fuck yeah, but you're like, yeah, let's go. <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, all right, and that's a cool, like even with a friend, it's cool, but certainly like with a person that you're married to, that you're doing this thing, and you've questioned all the planning that went into this and it fall apart on day one, that's a really cool thing, like a moment to have. Absolutely. And yeah. So we ended up finishing in the dark and uh, the crew, you could tell, was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> they can do this, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, How cool. Yeah, what really are there some other high points? I mean, are there any other things along the coast um, that you realized, you know, being native Texans, you're like, oh, wow, that was cool. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot, but I mean, are there any yeah. high points that come to mind? The one thing I think that stands out to me is, like, the character of our beaches. And I think each barrier island is so different. And I think in your mind you think, oh, the most beautiful beaches, you think of, like, Florida. It's white sand. It's blue water. And that's your idea of what a beautiful beach is. And, like, I think sometimes our beaches can get just a bad rap. But, like, walking the whole thing, I don't know. I just... 
every every barrier island you'd find different shells different colors of shells you find sea glass on bolivar but you wouldn't see it somewhere else and then one island had more blue shells and blue colors in them and it just was so unique and i think that that kind of made me appreciate our coast and i hope others will appreciate um is the people like the Mm -hmm. anglers we come across um I don't know. I just, everybody willing to help us. That yeah. was kind of what stood out the most to me. Yeah, and it's like um, this this guy wrote a, a book called The Gulf, and uh, he's got a line in there about the the Gulf of Mexico, and then it's really hard to connect with. Like it's easy to connect with the green belt because you just can either get to the top and look down, or you go down in it, and it's pretty easy mm-hmm. but the gulf you have to like wade into it you can't get anywhere unless you're in an airplane and really like see the coast you have to go get in it and in many cases it's hot and there may be mosquitoes and so this place there's no vantage point by which to really see it and appreciate it until you get in it and i think even those that live close to the coast don't go out to our barrier islands, into the beaches, and all of that. And when you do, you realize how wild it really is. Mm -hmm. Spend some time in Tampa, or Miami, or Orlando, or choose your city in Florida, or any other part of the coast that's, like, could be inhabitable. And it's inhabited and developed. And for the most part, I mean, where we were, it was pretty remote. And a lot of it's been conserved, either by U.S. Fish and Wildlife, or Parks and Wildlife, or some other um, organization. So it doesn't mean that we don't have more work to do, but I think that was one thing that we really appreciated was like, this is a really wild place that I don't think people really think of in that way. And truly wild in terms of the wildlife. Like you got two migratory flyways that come right through here. You've got a nursery for the entire Gulf. Our, uh, you talked about redfish and shrimp and even oysters and all of these things are reared in our bays and they're protected by those barrier islands, which is unique. When you look at the geography of the Gulf of Mexico, it's a very unique thing that we have here. And and it's definitely worth protecting. And then the I think this open space idea is is also interesting, like this gathering place that different from it's almost like our central park or another, you know, in, in the, let's say 50 or 60 years ago in Texas, you would have the town square. Those don't really exist mm-hmm. as much anymore. I mean, you can drive around to Mason and Fredericksburg and all these places. And but they, no one uses a town no square No one uses anymore. it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And we're not going to church as much anymore, right? So that's where you, like, would rub elbows and meet other people from different backgrounds, but you share this, like, common thing. And I would argue that the beach, even though you may not be a beach person, uh, it is a place where you can choose to go and be with all these people that share a common interest, which I would argue is like this love of Texas, mm-hmm. and be with people that are not necessarily of the same socioeconomic background, or maybe they don't share exactly the same interests, but you're there together and you're sharing this thing. And it's it's long. I mean, it's a big, 370 miles is, is a, it's it's a, a big ways, area. Yeah. Um, and anyone can access it. Like and anybody can access it. Yeah. So on that yeah. real quick, on the public as- aspect, you said, you know, from the, you know, wet sand basically to the first of vegetation mm-hmm. is a public easement. Mm-hmm. Is that only on those barrier islands? Is it on both sides? When you get off of that and you get to, you know, the actual shore, does that, like, where does that? It's just on the, the seaside. Just on the seaside. Yeah. That meets the it's Gulf. not on oh, the bay side. Okay. And only on the barrier islands. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about in the sections that there isn't a barrier island? Yeah, like a peninsula. Yeah, with same that. thing. Okay, it yeah. just, just defer to, yeah, defer to so, that basically. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So anything that's sort of touching the the Gulf, if okay. you will, um, that beach is has that easement. It reminds me a lot of you know here in Central Texas we have navigable waterways. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, a Very lot of similar. people. It's such a great. I mean, I have called the land office, Texas Parks and Wildlife, mm-hmm. local sheriffs, and I get different answers from all of them on what is actually navigable, what counts. Right. Um, I wish there was just a list of what was and there, is, but it, there's so much gray area because it's you know 30 feet wide. And there's so many details to it. Yeah. Um, so it kind of reminds me of that. But here locally, 
you know, you go hike up the wrong creek, you're definitely going to have an angry landowner there. So I'm surprised mm-hmm. you guys didn't have more issues with that. Or I'm also thinking like in the Houston area, are there not just big factories on the beach? I mean, could you actually get through? I'm guessing you're on the barrier island. So a lot of those industries were probably on the mainland yeah. you're on the coast. So that kind of worked out. Okay. Yeah. And even, I mean, probably the most, the two most developed areas, I would argue, would be like Galveston, because you've got a bunch of houses, mm-hmm. South Padre, you've got uh, hotels and, and other things, same same with Galveston. That Freeport area, uh, so south of uh, Galveston Island, there's a um, there's a lot of industry there, and it's pretty close to the barrier islands. Um, but, yeah, I mean, for the most part, of course you see it, and there is development in, in pockets uh, here, there. But I think part of it, too, is you've got, this dune system in most of the islands so you feel like you're you're just kind of looking at the, at the ocean mm-hmm. um you don't necessarily see some of that because behind you i guess you'd have the dunes and so you're kind of in your own yeah. world there that's, yeah, yeah exactly. how cool. yeah. and i think that's partly why maybe you and me too you you get to some of these areas even corpus and you're like oh well there's corpus christi bay but I don't see a beach per se. I just see buildings and all all of this infrastructure. And so it really, it takes you getting out to the ocean itself to be like, oh, okay, this is really pretty. And it's different from what I would call the coast. It's, it's this other, um, you know, Gulf facing part of, uh, of what we've got here. So, yeah. What I never thought about it like that before. It's fascinating. Yeah. Um, all right. You're buying a beach house. You have to live in it the rest of your life. Where are you buying it on the coast? Hmm. What's your favorite part? I know that's a hard one. I bet I know where you would go. Surfside? Well, yeah, maybe Surfside. Surfside was cool. That That was was a whole... Where's Surfside? That was fun. Um, Surfside... Near Lake Jackson. It's like... uh, That's the Houston area? South of Houston. Okay. Mm -hmm. And pretty undeveloped, like, just how... Like, homes. Just people's homes kind of line the beach. And kind of seems like more of an eclectic community and that was the first time i think somebody re- like was looking for us because mm-hmm. we heard people and they're there those houses were set a little bit further back and we could see somebody hear someone like yelling at us <laughs> and couldn't make out what they were saying but then we just started waving um but that community was was pretty cool um It's hard. What did you think I was going to say? I thought you were going to say um, East Matagorda Peninsula. Oh. Or Matagorda well, yeah, Peninsula. Because no, there's only, on Matagorda. Matagorda Peninsula, yeah. There's only two people that live there. Is it really? Full time. Full time. Is that the one? Um, so I grew up and still love going fishing in Port O'Connor, right on the oh, point. So is yeah. that, are you that's talking it. about, is that the community right there on that island? You, you can only, those people built those houses with barges, basically? Yeah, mm-hmm. that's it. So I've got a buddy of mine that I've been, now I'm working on my pilot's license, so I'm going to do it. But there's an old Navy base there. Mm-hmm. I think it's Navy. Madagoda, on Madagoda uh, Island. Yeah, Army Corps. Yeah. And yeah. I really want to go fly into that, go fishing for the afternoon right there. Because those two, the, when there's that cut, those two jetties is like, I spent my childhood fishing those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Fish for a little bit, hop back in the plane and take off. Yeah. And so, there are two airstrips. There's that one, and then on Matagorda Island itself, there's an airstrip. I wouldn't Good. land on that one. Okay. No, not on that one. Yeah. You may have federal agents. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Texas Parks and Wildlife manage Matagorda Island. But the peninsula, yeah, you're right. I think I would, because there was nobody out there. That's pretty cool out there. Yeah. We found a suburban that was totally Upside submerged down. in the sand in the beach. With just a license plate, you could just and see the, the right back tail end, yeah. Out of, out of the sand. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I have a feeling there's some high school kids involved with yeah. that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> well, and then we riding. found uh, some sailboats, big sailboats. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, I'm not good with with estimations on sailboats, but like 30 foot long uh, catamarans yeah. that had washed ashore from either. Miami or Corpus or Holy somewhere. Cow. Yeah. Do people not have trackers coast. on their boats. I guess not. Or I think at some point they just yeah. like it's difficult to, to get those to get boats that, yeah. out. And these are some remote parts of uh, of the coastline. So well, a hurricane comes through and they get their insurance it's, money and they're like, eh. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I don't want to know where it is. Yeah. But the shells, like lightning welts, which is, I guess, the official state shell. Um, they're, I mean, I found big ones and yeah. like, those are, I, I didn't realize beachcombing is such a big thing here or just anyone that lives on the coast. 
there's a bunch of bi- uh, pages I follow now um, oh, interesting. through Facebook. Mm-hmm. People are very proud of what they find. And so I'm thinking like all the stuff that we found that in the areas where people don't usually travel. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of fun. Yeah, to, how neat. We got to hold peregrine falcons. We, oh, there was yeah, a group that was um, yeah. monitoring and then um, getting blood samples and, and DNA and banding peregrines that are born up in the tundra, the Arctic tundra. And these are three months old that we the saw. They're traveling. Were... They'll do a 12,000-mile round trip from the Arctic to some go as far as Patagonia and back. Wow. And they, they hug the Texas coast. And so we got a chance to um, see those throughout the journey, but then actually hold them and, and release, release them and everything. Release it, which was really cool. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, just I think our hope for this project is – that it's something that we experience. We won't. We hopefully, our passion for it and those that that live there and care about it that it like comes across and and that it's entertaining. That's like, mm-hmm. I think the biggest thing with these projects with film is you have an idea, and then you do the thing, and it's totally different than what you expected, and so it's you can't script it, and then it's about telling the story in in a way that is engaging to people hopefully um and that they at the end of the series that hopefully they care enough about it to in the future when there's a billion dollar uh investment in state parks or whatever it is that they'll be they'll they'll be more supportive of of that um those efforts so well i know i'm very excited to see it when it comes out uh do you do we know when it's coming out do you have a release date yeah october this fall this fall fall? yeah so we don't have a official date yet but it'll be in October Um, and that'll be on Austin PBS and then hopefully throughout the state maybe outside of the state um, that's our like public broadcast distribution and then depending on how good it is then maybe it'll be on Amazon and Google Play and all these other streaming platforms that would be amazing yeah well we'll keep an eye out for it and when the time comes I'm more than happy to do whatever I can with media and whatnot to help spread the word. Um, I know I'm excited for it. Um, I don't want to cut us short because I could honestly sit here for several (laughs) hours. I have so many things about Texas Parks and Wildlife I want to ask you and and a million different things, but um, I think we'll have to do a a second episode one day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But what what did we miss? Is there anything kind of in closing that you guys want to talk about or anything about the film people should know? I don't know. I feel like we've covered our whole life history. (laughs) And the and the series yeah yeah um i don't know i don't think so is there any is there do you have a website for the film or if people yeah, want to Ch- start chasing the tide okay film dot com dot yeah. com okay on and social media yeah we'll start posting more we we posted as we walked um and then now we'll start kind of revisiting stories and i mean i took tons of pictures of trash that i found and cool treasures that i'm gonna start uh putting up is that at chasing the tide film or how do people find you there uh, ch- yeah i think it's chasing the tide film is the social media too. okay perfect on just instagram and facebook okay um, yeah yeah if any we'll, we'll do some behind the scenes stuff you can sign up too on the uh, website to get we'll s- try to send twice a month kind of emails and updates with behind the scenes okay cool coverage footage yeah 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 i, I, I guess i would say one of the things with these projects in particular that doesn't always come across to people that see see the the end result is how many people are involved in making these things happen and so mm-hmm. we get an opportunity to talk to you all and and um, thank you for that there should sure. be like 60 other people <laughs> with yeah. us because um, we're not necessarily experts in one thing or the other or uh, even filmmaking, and if not for all of the folks that either volunteer their time or uh, were part of the team, um, I, th- I think that's something that even we didn't realize just how much effort it takes and partnerships and good faith. And um, it's that part I think is really mm-hmm. exciting to see all these people's talents like be. Um, in the limelight, if you will, whether it's with the book or we're even developing some curriculum with with a curriculum writer for uh, PBS Learning Media 
that partnership with PBS, they're excited about it. I think we'll probably have a some kind of a premiere with them, and um, so maybe as a as parting advice, if you're thinking about making a film or doing something like this, do it and be um, open to to folks getting involved because you're gonna need it. You're gonna need help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, it sounds like you two had quite. Uh, an adventurous journey yet again on another one, and I'm yeah. sure there'll be many more to come. Um, are there any on this calendar? I mean, do you have another? Well, I want to walk the coast again, but okay. maybe do the, uh, maybe the opposite, the opposite direction. Way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> maybe every five years to just see how it's changed. There you go. Know. Yeah. Or add to my collection of. <laughs> I want to run items, the Appalachian yeah. Trail, but you I got to. Oh, that'd be neat. I got to get in better shape. <laughs> I've done one small segment of that trail, and it was incredible. Oh, but, yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, man, thank you. Thank you all both thank so you. much for thank coming on. So it was so wonderful us, yeah. talking with you. And thank you so much for everything that you're doing for conservation. You you guys don't have to do this. You don't have to go walk the coastline. You don't have to do any of this. But you've put your, your money, your blood, your sweat, and your tears into it. And so I'm very thankful for it. Yeah. Thank cool. you so Fun. much. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> cool.